to be this morning. I know I realize it's Father's Day, and uh, I thought about talking to, to uh, dads and, and potential dads and future dads and old dads and young dads and all of that, and then I decided not to. Because what we're going to go through this morning and what we've been looking at in Romans 6, 7, here and 8 uh, over these next couple weeks, if you're a father, you need to be doing this. If you're a single man, or and actually, I should take that back. We all should be doing this, no matter who you are. Whether you're a ma- dad, a mom, a, a husband, a wife, single, married, going to be married, not married, wishing you were married, wishing I was going to get married, and whatever... This information is critical to all aspects because when you, I mean, you think about that. Here you are, your mom and dad, you got kids. Your kids are single. One day your kids might be what? Married. Married. So you're preaching and you're teaching your children is single stuff. What are they going to do? They're going to take that when they go get married as well, you, you hope. And that's the goal. So as we have been looking through um, this issue, the issues here in Romans 6, 7, and today we're in chapter 7, we're just going to sit right here in chapter 7, and then uh, we're, we'll get through chapter 7 next week, and then the following week uh, the, the, the men will be filling in. Uh, Linda and I, we're going to go away for the weekend, and then we'll be back and we'll get into chapter 8 and so forth. So I think that's right. Next week I'm here. Than the next, yeah, I think. <laughs> anyway, just whoever shows up, who shows up, okay? But uh, so as we as we look at this, we've been talking about our walk. We've been talking about who we are in Christ. The first five chapters of the book of Romans, you find out that you're a sinner, you're lost, you're ungodly, you need a savior. You in in the first in chapter one. Verse 18 down to the end of chapter 1 there, he, he tells you why you're lost, what your condition is. Then in chapter 2 and 3, half of 3, he gives the excuses that man come up with. Well, I'm a good guy. I live a good life. You know, the, 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 the grandma theology is what I call it. Well, grandma was a great lady. She was a wonderful lady. But was she saved? Don't say anything bad about grandma, Okay. Well, that's an excuse that comes out of Romans 2. I'm a good guy. I'm a good person. I do good. I'm a Boy Scout. I do this. And he says, that isn't even going to work. Chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says that we've proved that all are under sin. Both the Jew, the Gentile, everybody are sinners. Then in the rest of chapter 3, he says, okay, you're a sinner. Now here's your Savior. And he paints the, 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 the issue of justification for you. And then in chapter 4, in chapter uh, 3, you, you see the fact that he is the just and the justifier. And it's faith in his blood and what he did on Calvary that's going to get you there. Then in chapter 4, he says, there's nothing for you to do. You just have to, by faith, believe him and trust him. Romans 4, verse 5. And the moment that that happens... Then he gets into the assurance in in the rest of 4, and in all of chapter 5, he says, you got that? Now, now, no matter what comes your way, you never lose him and who you are in Christ. And you have peace, and you have tranquility. And no matter what comes up in life, as a believer, as a member of the body of Christ, you have him. Ephesians 1 and verse 13, he says that when you trust the gospel, you're sealed with the Spirit, with the Spirit. You're encapsulized. You're, you're put into Christ. You're sealed. Then he says in chapter 6, and we've spent the last two weeks in 6, he says, okay, you got, that, you're, you got your justification down. Now here's your new identity. And he comes along in chapter 6, and he says, now here's, your, here's who you are. You were that over there. Now you're this. Now you're a new creature. Now you, now you are a new man. There's something new going on in your life now, in your inner man. And he, and he rolls over in chapter 6 and he says, Hey, listen, <laughs> you are so identified with Christ that his death is now your death. His burial is your burial. His resurrection is your resurrection. 
and you have a co-identity, a co-ness there, a, a oneness of it, bone of his bone and flesh of his, you're made there, you're, you're put there together with him. And because of that, you know what? You've been set free from sin. Sin no longer has dominion over you. It doesn't run your life because that's not who you are. You're this new guy. By the way, the new guy will move from room to room because I don't want the sides not liking each other, okay? Usually this is the law side and this is the grace side. But we've got to flip it every now and then because, you know, we've got to keep everybody honest. Yeah. It's, folks, it's just Sunday morning. I could break the jokes out. <laughs> uh, you, no, no, okay, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, everybody's like, no, not on the jokes, okay? They're dad jokes, you know, come on, you know. Please. <laughs> uh, Romans 6, he goes on and he says, listen, guys. You're not under the law, but you're under grace, so sin doesn't have dominion over you. This is your position in Christ. We're talking about position here. This is who you are. We're watching the ball game. I use that illustration with the softball championships, and the, the lady at first base makes the play, and she's playing her position. That's who she is. She's trained to be that. You understand that. You're, you're, you and I are taught uh, you, you're in Romans 7. I told you we we're going to stay there. Uh, that's, go, go back to chapter 5. Yeah, can't stay there very long. Look at chapter 5. Look at verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith. We have this wealth, this riches of His grace, and we can access it by faith, we're playing our position. We learn and we understand who we are in Christ. Here's our identity. Then last week, we saw that, hey, we have a choice in who we serve. And you come over there into chapter 6 and verse 16, the principle is real clear. It's amazing how many people think Bible stuff is really hard to understand and really technical and all this. And it's really not. It's really the simplicity that's in Christ. Look at 6.16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey. We understand that principle, don't we? If I go out here and I turn and I yield, turn myself over, let influence and control, who's running my life, whatever this is? You take sports, you know, I, I watched that softball, the World Series, and there was a young lady there on one of the teams, I can't remember, she had a heart issue, she'd been through like three or four surgeries, but softball was her life, and the team that she played for, the school, gave her the chance and the scholarship and all that stuff, but you know what it did? It consumed her life. She's a senior. She let softball run everything. Now she's going to graduate and go have another a fifth heart surgery or something goofy. So the story goes. But now what consumes her life? Whatever she turns herself over to. So if you let sin run your life, who are you choosing to obey? Look at the rest of 16. Whether of sin, which is unto death, for the wages of sin is death, or of obedience unto righteousness. See, the Word of God's not hard to understand. That's a principle we all understand. Who I, I drive a school bus to pay bills, okay? I drove a water truck for a while in the construction. It consumed my life. And I was like, wait a minute. Time to make a change. School bus driving doesn't consume my life, okay? That did. The money's better driving the water truck, by the way, by about 20 bucks, okay? But what consumed my life? That did. So what do I do? I can get rid of that and go back to do this because this is what consumes my life. The principles. If we serve sin, then we're going to look like the dead man, the heathen. If we serve righteousness, then we're going to look like who we are in Christ, and the life of Christ is going to live out through us. Now, being a dead guy has some benefits. 
And that's what we're going to talk about now as we go into Romans 7. We now understand our position, who we are in Christ. We're dead to sin and we're alive to God. What stops sin in our life is the cross, and now we have a life to go and live. But we just need to understand to play by the right rules of the game. If you play softball and you do it with football rules, and I'm talking about, you know, football, not soccer, but football, okay, then you're going to have trouble on the diamond, aren't you? Could you imagine trying to play softball on a football field with soccer rules? That's Christian dumb, though. Okay? Romans 7, Paul brings up the next point. Know ye not. Again, notice the know ye not. <laughs> he, he did that to you in Romans 6, verse 3. Know ye not. Verse 6 of Romans 6, he says, knowing this. Verse 9, knowing. Likewise, reckon. Yeah, he, you got, there's some things to know. Know ye not, chapter 7, verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he what? liveth. Now, I want you to notice some words here. How that the law hath what? Dominion. So remember that. As long as he liveth. So as long as you're living, the law has a dominion on you, doesn't it? Now watch verse 2. He's going to use an illustration here. He's going to come along and say something to you. For the woman hath, which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he, what? Liveth. But if the husband be what? She is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulterer. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now, we're going to go back through some of these verses. Did you, I wanted you to catch some words. Dominion. The law has dominion. But it has dominion as long as you what? Live. But if you die, it no longer has dominion over you. Now, come out of chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Aren't we dead to sin? We just learned that in Romans 6. So we're a dead man walking. <laughs> dead man living. Uh, okay. Fear the walking of the dead. Now we are dead to something else. Chapter 6, we're dead to sin. Now we're going to find out that we're dead to the law. Now go back up into verse 1. Know ye not. Again, some more information here for us to know. He says, for I speak to them that know the law. Who is that? It's Israel. Come over to chapter 2 of Romans. Just flip back a couple pages. Chapter 2 and verse 14. So Paul's going to use an example here about the law. And he's going to use some information here that, that indicates that, hey, you are dead to the law. Two, two, uh, chapter 2, verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law. So who is the law given to? Not the Gentiles, but to who? To Israel. Chapter 7, verse 1. How that the law hath dominion. And again, that's going to be the key here. Over the man as long as he liveth. Then he uses the illustration of marriage under the law. And what the, the, the covenant of marriage is, is that the husband is bound to the wife as long as he or she liveth. That's why in the marriage ceremony, you do the till death do us part. What's going to part the marriage? What breaks the marriage? Death does. What breaks the law and the hold of the law on you? Death does. So it's death. And there's a benefit from being free from the reaches of the law, and it's death to the law. So being dead has some benefits. Have you ever been in a funeral, and you walk up to the casket, and you look at the guy, and you tickle him? Oh, my goodness, you touched a dead body. Woo -hoo -hoo. Now just go up there and say, hey, you know, and, and 
and see what they do? What do they do? Absolutely nothing. Why? They're dead. There's no life. They're dead to the moment, aren't they? You know, you go over there and I, <laughs> I was I was with dad one time. We were little and uh, we were at a funeral home and I, I'm a boy. So we like to go and uh, we like to go and search things out and see what's around the corner and behind the doors, you know. And you know, you, you know, and you open the door, and th- there's the room where the mortuary, the the morticians are working, and the bo- and it's like whoa, and then one of them twitch. Right, they'll scare you to death. Or run back, hey dad, run back. he's like, son, what were you doing back there? And get over here, stand right here, right here, right here. Don't you move, you know? What, what, what? It ha- there's no life when you're dead. There's a benefit here when it comes to the issue of the law. Paul has already just told us in chapter 6, we're not under the law, but we're under grace. The dominion, the control. What controls your walk now? We are, look at verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law. How? How did we become dead to the law? By the body of Christ that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, because we are dead, that's our position in Christ. We are been, we've been crucified. That old man is gone. And because we're dead, now we are dead to the authority of the law over, and over here in our lives. By the way, you understand we're talking spiritually here, functionally? We're not talking literally. I, I, I was kidding the, the lady at the bus yard who hires the bus drivers that her test is a, the mirror test. Stick the mirror underneath the nose and see if they're breathing. You're hired. <laughs> you know, we get some doozies, you know. But, so we're not talking about the physical because I'm looking at you. We're talking about functionally, spiritually. We have also been raised from that dead, haven't we? We've been given the newness of life. So you, when you died here, and we're talking about death, we're talking about to the law. Come over with me to just one book, Ephesians chapter 5. You died with him. When <coughs> Colossians, get Ephesians 5, but get Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. When you and I trusted Christ, He gave us His life. He gave us a new identity. He made us dead to the law. The law doesn't have dominion. It doesn't have control over you. It's not what we're going to play by. The, The law, there's 613 or something like that commandments in the Old Testament. How are you doing? Can I ask you to tell me where the, the top ten are. Most people can't. You know, they can, they'll get the thou shalt not kill and steal, and then, then they stop. The law, inform, things that are designed to control you. Look at Colossians 2, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. Now, God does an operation on you. This is all spiritual. He goes in there. You know, the, remember the game operation? You touch the sides and it zaps you, you know. He goes in and he does, he does, he literally takes your inner man, your soul and your spirit, and literally cuts it away from the body of flesh in a spiritual speaking. And he cuts away the, the dominion and the bondage that's connected to your old man. You've been set free. Isn't that what we learned in Romans 6? Keep reading. Verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, 
hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Never think it's just some, it's all of them. Blot, now watch verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, there's the law, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When we talk here, in, now go back to Ephesians 5. When we talk here about being free, dead to the law, we're talking about the only way you can be dead to the law is to be in Christ. Because what did he do to the law? The law says, here's sin, here's what it looks like, you're doing it, you're guilty. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Here's sin, here's what it looks like, you're doing it, and you're guilty. It never tells you how to fix it. It'll tell you some things to do, but they're not enough. The blood of bulls and goats never took away sin. You go in there and you do, if, if you were in the Jewish system and you're doing, 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 and he just, you know, he, the, you got to love the Lord. He looks over at him and he goes, why in the world would I want your stinking, rotten sacrifices? I've only always wanted your heart. That's what I wanted. And you guys over here are trying to delight in serving me and all this stinking, rotten, dirty, smelly, grotesque sacrifice stuff. And you're doing it without the heart. And I want your heart. In Christ, what happened? He took that guilt and he nailed it to his cross. He took that ordinance that said you have to have perfect righteousness in order to get into the kingdom of God. And he nailed it. And he says, you know what? They'll have my righteousness now. He was made to be sin that we would be made righteous. I'll nail that up there. Ephesians 5. Watch. Well, you know what, for time, go back to Romans 7. We'll just let Ephesians roll. I, I look at the clock. I know it's a father's. By the way, dads, you need to know this stuff. You need to understand this. If you were in Ephesians 5, you probably left it down. Go down to Romans. We're going to talk about this. Go back to Ephesians, but go into chapter 6. And the, the reason I say that and the reason I think about it is I want to get down through Romans 7 about and where the benefits are here. But the issue is, is for dads or and grandfathers, I'll be honest with you, but really for all of us. Look, look at Romans 6 and look at verse number 4. So you have marriage. That's the end of chapter 5. Children show up because that's usually what happens out of marriage. Okay, Ephesians 6. Then he talks to the dads because the dads are the head, the husbands, the dads are the heads of the family. He says, Father... And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That's an interesting idea. But bring them up in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. It's an interesting thing how he says that. Bring them. He doesn't say send them. He says what? Bring them. You're going you grab that little dude by the back of the neck and you bring him with you. You're going and you grab that little dude by the, well, you grab that kid and you bring him. You see that? Nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You take that phrase. I did it when I found out we were going to have kids. All right, Lord, what are you talking about? And you go all the way. It goes all the way back into, the gen, into Genesis with Abraham. Actually, it goes back to, to Adam, but... You see it more clearly with Abraham. And he looks at Abraham and he says, I know you'll teach your children what I'm teaching you. And what ends up happening is over there in, in Israel, as they ask a question, the children ask a question of dad, dad, why do we do this? Why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we doing this sacrifice or whatever? And it's the dad's job to then do what? Here's why. Here's the verses. Here's the doctrine. And here we go. Well, it, how does dad know all that? Because he went and learned it, and he's bringing his children with him. Okay, you follow that? The stuff we're talking about here in Romans 7 is the same thing. 
Folks, we don't live under the law. We live under grace. The law. Go back into chapter 7 of Romans. There is a situation here in Romans 7, when verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. There's the only way to function properly today in the age of grace is to understand not only your position in Christ, who you are, okay, and you make that decision to serve Him, but now you're to come over here and to do, all, do the walk under the principles of grace and not the law. Too often times, people get, uh, they learn right division, they learn mid-acts dispensationalism, they understand we're not Israel, we're the body, and they begin to make the decisions until it comes to their walk. And then they go right back underneath Israel's program. They go back under, there in Galatians, what he calls the yoke of bondage. And they say, well, you know, if you, if you teach grace, everybody, you, you're teaching an undisciplined life because you can just go live any way you want. And that is the furthest from the truth. God Almighty is more interested in how you live today than he ever was how they did it over there in Israel's program. Because what did he do to you? He made you complete. He provided all the spiritual blessings. He provided all of the, all of the sufficiency. Everything you need, he says, here it is. And you access it by faith and you go and do. And when you do that, you begin to learn, you know what? Grace holds me more accountable than the law ever did. Because grace says, it's a free gift. I give it to you. It's all yours. Now, what are you going to do with it? The Godhead's sitting there today. What are you going to do with it? Let's watch you. Let's see what Rick does with it today. Goes down, I get the pool. I got green little spots in the pool. Dip the water in, take it down there, goes to the pool guy. He does his little test. He says, well, what were you do doing, dummy? Don't you know you got to have this, this, this? And I go, oh, I don't know. Green spot showed up. <laughs> there was blue one day and green the next. What happened? I don't know. He goes, well, you got to do this and you got to do that. And da, da, da. I go, well, it's a salt system. Isn't that supposed to correct it? No. What do you mean it's a salt system? Oh, my. And he, I got $300 worth of junk to take out of there to fix the green. I'm sitting there. I didn't do it, but. Yeah, it's just big deal. And I'm sitting there going, my goodness. So I talked to Linda about filling the goofy thing in. <laughs> Put it back to dirt, you know. But what do you do? You get all that going on, and what happens to you? You get all wound up, don't you? You go crazy. That's a good one. Yeah, I did. So now I got it down to majority blue and a little bit of green here and there on the, you know. So I'm not quite back yet. What do you do with it? You just go in and you say, hey, it's a detail of life, and I can apply some peace and some tranquility, and I can just relax and go fix what needs to be fixed. You know what the law, the law didn't do that. The law says, hey, boom, boom, you got to go. The law has you down there doing the $300 route. <laughs> I didn't do that route, I, Okay. He gave me two routes. It was funny. He saw the look on my face, and he, he goes, well, there is another route. You can drain it. You can do this and that. And I said, all right, well, we're doing that route. <laughs> you know. What, what is your condition? What are the rules are we playing by? We're playing by grace. Look at verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto. Isn't that interesting? Every time the law goes to work, sin shows up and death shows up. Isn't that fascinating? So if I don't want death and I want life, then who doesn't show up? The law. The motion of sin. I love that. The movement, the activity. Verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of law. But now we are what? Delivered. We're not under the law. We're under grace. We're, we're going to play the rules under the grace side. 
And again, folks, he's talking about walking in the newness. I love that. In the newness of the Spirit. We're talking about walking in the Spirit and living as our lives as who we are. But walking and living in, in line with the grace message and the grace life. Say it like that. That's fascinating. It doesn't mean you go live your life undisciplined. Do you know of the Ten Commandments? Paul tells you and I as members of the body of Christ to do nine of them. Bet you didn't know that. Go read Romans 13, verse 9. It's right there. There's one that he says you don't do, and that's keep the Sabbath. Because that is a shadow of things to come. It belongs to the nation of Israel specifically. And it's got some other things. And that's not you. You're the body of Christ. So you go over there and you read those. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not covet. Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Thou shalt not have no other gods before. Now we are in really trouble. Because for some of you, it's the softball. <laughs> and the, the football and the soccer and, and the Harley, you know. And other things that just kind of get in there. But he says, no, you're going to put all that away because of who you are in Christ. Now watch verse 7. Do, do you understand that? You, you get that idea? I'm not going in great detail in these. I'm just trying to get you to, you're dead to the law. The law does not have any dominion over you. Now watch verse 7. What shall we say then? Paul is anticipating an objection. If you say that we're dead to the law, then the law has got to be sinful, doesn't it? Is the law sin? See the question? If you're telling us, Rick, you can go live and be as who you are in Christ and you don't have to live under the law, then the law has got to be sinful. It just has to be. And what does Paul say? God forbid. No, it doesn't. It's not that way at all. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Look at that. But sin taking occasion. By the way, when he says I, he's talking about himself. He's not talking about unsaved people here. He's talking about you and I, members of the body of Christ. When we look at that law, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not. The law comes in. You see, the law is a mirror. It, you know what it is in a mirror? I looked in the mirror this morning and went, oh, yeah, why bother? <laughs> you know, you get dressed. We're trying to fix the mic issue. So we're trying to put the mic in a different place and this and that. And, and then the guys are like, now look in the mirror. Make a note somewhere that you know where that mic is because <laughs> that's where it needs to be. What is it? What do you, you know what the problem with the mirror? You know what the problem is? The guy looking in the mirror. That's the problem. Notice what he said. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. The point that Paul's going to make now as we go down through here is the law is not the problem. You're the problem. The sinner is the problem. Verse number 8, sin, the all manner of concupiscence, sin, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy. And the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin. That it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And off he goes and we'll get into all that next week. Notice that the issue is sin is the problem. You're the problem. The law is good. It's holy. It's righteous. It's God's law. It, the law that he gave to Moses, he had given to Adam over here. And Adam was doing, and Abraham picks up and does. 
And Noah picks up and does. How in the world would Noah know to get off the boat, the ark, and go make a sacrifice and do what he did? And take the seven clean anim- seven of all the clean animals and do. How in the world would he know that? God's been teaching him. But it's his law, isn't it? Galatians, he says, the, because of the transgression, the law was added to the, to the promise. You see, sin took an opportunity here. And what it did was it took the law, and the law is what made sin come alive. Look there in verse 7. For I had not known lust except the law had said. I, uh, back up in that verse, nay, I had not known sin but by the law. What did the law say? That's sin. Look over at Romans 5. Folks, as you come to chapter 7, you've already been through Romans 5. This is a fascinating thing here, Romans 5. Start there in verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now watch the parenthesis. It starts in verse 13. For until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So the guy is from Adam, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them which had not sinned after the similitude of Adam, transgression who is in the figure of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of many, Of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many, offense is unto justification. And you keep verse 17, ends the quote, ends the parenthesis, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more, they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign and life by one, Jesus Christ. You see this contrast back and forth. But what made sin come alive? The law did. Because the law said, you're guilty. You broke it. Here's my standard, and you broke it. I love verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So when you come over here to 7, verse 8, but sin taking occasion by the commandment, it took it. Sin's the problem. You didn't know it until the law showed up, and when the law showed up, what did it do? It Man, it made sin come alive. You come over to, hold on to here, you come over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse 56, the end of the, the, end of the, the, uh, the end of the chapter. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. Where does sin get its strength? The law. You know what God says? What Paul says? You're dead to the law. Sin doesn't have a dominion over you. You've been crucified. You've been set free. Now come back to chapter 7, verse 9. For I was alive without the law once. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) I was living in freedom to do whatever I wanted to do. I was out there kicking it back with the boys, hanging out with the girls. I was doing everything I wanted to do. I was free. But when the commandment came, uh uh-oh, when the law showed up, you know what it made him conscious of? Sin. Sin revived, and I died. I was out there doing what I wanted to do, lived any way I wanted to live, and the law came up, and you know what it made me conscious? It made me conscious that sin lived in me, and that it was him, he, He did it. He died for that sin. 
and I died. He died, functionally. He died. And you know what? I'm powerless against that. He did it. He took care of it. Because if I try to take care of it, sin just comes alive. You you, you know that. (laughs) The energy of your own flesh, verse 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life. I found to be unto death. The idea, come over to chapter 10, in verse number 5. Here's the idea of that. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall... Live by them. If I'm out there trying to live by the law, you know what it is? It just kills me. I'm dead. I out there, I'm trying to live the law, and I'm trying to do the law, and I'm trying to keep the thou shalt nots, and you know what happens? I just knock myself. I can't do it. I fail. I die. So verse 11, he says, 711, For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. And by it slew me. The blame for our condition is on sin, not the law. That's the blame. The blame isn't on God's righteous law. It's on you and I. It's on sin. Verse 12, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy, and just and good. The law isn't the problem, folks. The problem is sin. Well, wait a minute. My identity says I'm what? Dead to sin and alive to God. You follow that? Uh, Death has some benefits here. The benefit is is the law doesn't run me anymore. The, The benefit is is I'm alive to God now. I hope you get that. I I feel like it's not, I've said the same thing about 80 different times, different ways. I hope you get that. Verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin. If you come down to verse 17, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Verse 20, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So it, it, it dwells in you. So here we are. We're learning we're dead to sin and alive in Christ. We have a decision to make. Do we serve sin or do we serve righteousness? We understand that the problem that we're having in serving God isn't. Uh, it's the ability to control sin. That's the problem. It's the ability to control our flesh. We need to not only decide to serve Christ, take our bodies and yield them to be servants of righteousness, but we also need to realize that we're dead to the law and that the law doesn't can't come in and cause sin to revive. Because the issue isn't the law, the issue is sin. How am I controlling sin? Grace says, we're in, we're in Titus 2, verse 12, in, the, in our Sunday school hour, the grace of God teaching us that denying. He looks over in Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, and he says, purge yourself from these things. He looks over there in 1 Timothy 6, to Timothy, and he says, flee these youthful lusts. You have to make a decision. Grace says, recognize who you are in Christ. Understand that. Get to know it. Get to know him. And then go live your life in it. And you know what you real quickly begin? The law will never get you there. Can we do one more verse? Galatians chapter 5. Galatians, like I ask your permission, right? We're going to Galatians 5. I try to be a gentleman when I can. 
Look at Galatians 5. You see, folks, you need to know who you are in Christ. You need to understand that you're a new creature. You have a new identity. You have a new position. And you need to understand that God's grace, the working of the Holy Spirit in your life, will never lead you to live under the law. Who leads you to live under the law is you. Because you're looking for somebody to tell you what to do. I can do that. I don't want to. Look at Galatians 5. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, period. Isn't that an interesting verse? (laughs) Oh, Rick, I'm struggling with sin. Are you walking in the Spirit? Well, I'm doing the best I can. No, are you walking in the Spirit? That's an interesting thing. You go over to Romans 5, verse 18. It says, don't be drunk with wine as well as us, but be filled with the Spirit. The comparison verse is over in Colossians where he ta- talks about, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Walking in the Spirit, folks, is being in the book. You're in the book. Are you in the book? Are you in the Word of God rightly divided? Are you there? If you are, guess what's not going to be fulfilled? The flesh, sin, the law. It'll just be jettisoned. For, verse 17, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. So you, there's a battle going on, okay? But watch verse 18. But if ye be led of the spirit, you're letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. You're letting the grace of God teach you. Ye are not under the law. The Spirit of God will never lead you to the law. It's counterproductive. Because the law, sin revives and sin gets, comes back. So when you come back to Romans 7, we'll go back down through the rest of the passage because he gets into a debate here with himself, <laughs> back and forth, using himself, Paul, as an illustration of what happens when the law gets involved. And the conflict and the confusion. Just walk away this morning, Dad, with an understanding that you've got a job in raising children and being there and doing, and you do have rules of the house. I'm not saying you have a ruleless house. <laughs> but you also have the opportunity to show here's what grace does, and here's what grace looks like. And we'll deal with whatever the. I, I, I remember my kids started driving. I looked at him and I said, you can get tickets all day long, I don't care, but don't hit anything. Don't crash the car. Because that now we're now it's a headache. Okay? So what do they do? They go crash the car. All of them but one. All but one. Including mom. We'll throw her in there. All. I'm like, don't crash the car. What was my rule? Don't crash. The, and what they do? I'm like, okay. See, it revives sin in them of disobedience. But I'm their dad. If you're a dad or a future to be, this applies. If you're a mom, a grandma, this applies. Because when you start adding in that, you know, you know what happens when somebody tells you, hey, you better go do this. What do you usually do? No, I don't. Yeah, and you rebel. Who are we? Are members of the Most High, saints of the Most High God. We're members of the Church, the Body of Christ, and we live under the issues of the grace life. We know who we are. We understand our identity. And by the way, if you don't know any of that, it's right here. You just got to study. That's it. And when that happens, life doesn't become pie in the sky by and by thing. It does give you a way to handle the details of life because you're free from the law and you're free to serve him as who you are in Christ. Have a life controlled by the authority of God's word rightly divided and the authority of the Holy Spirit. And you know what you'll begin to do? Things will shape up and you'll begin to notice, how do I get that? It's through his word having that be what's the authority in your life. Okay?
All right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our position that we're in Christ. We thank you that we can understand it. And we thank you that you changed the rules of the game so that we can succeed and have victory. And we'll just give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's.